Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Richard Slotkin. He's a cultural critic and historian. He's the Olin Professor of English and American Studies at Westland University and the author of eight books. His trilogy, Regeneration Through Violence, The Fatal Environment, and Gunfighter Nation is, I believe, one of the most important pieces of cultural criticism around. Thank you so much for being on the program. Oh, you're quite welcome. Um, so I guess my first question is, for people who who don't know this trilogy, what let's let's just start off. What do you, what do you mean by regeneration through violence, and and what are you saying in these in these massive and important books? Okay, well, uh, first I guess the most basic idea that that I'm working with is this notion of the national myth. And the essential point is that, that uh, when nation states are formed, they're, they're political innovations. And particularly, the, this is particularly true of the United States, which originates as a series of European colonies uh, 3,000 miles from home. And in order, to, uh, in order to give people who belong to the state uh, a, a sense of being rooted in time, of having a common past, despite the fact that they represent various ethnic groups and regional and provincial groups, to give them a sense of a common identity and a common past, the people who form the nation state, that is the political leadership, will develop what I call a national myth, uh, which is simply uh, a story of how the nation came to be. Uh, who was it who formed it? Who were the heroes uh, or the geniuses who, uh, who brought the people together, like Moses for uh, the children of Israel, uh, and, and helped create the nation state? And for the United States, uh, I guess the most obvious uh, version of this is the, the myth of the revolution and George Washington as the father of his country and so on. But in my work, I went back further than the revolution. I went back to the original settlements, which is where the, the, the origin of American culture really is, in those first colonial settlements in the wilderness. And what I found was that the story that linked all of the different colonies, uh, and, and remember that the colonies were... Uh, some were, were uh, Catholic, some were Anglican, and others were various different Protestant sects originally, that what united them was this common theme of the conquest of the wilderness, uh, that they were bringing Christianity and civilization to a savage wilderness inhabited only uh, by Indians, as they would have uh, called them, or savages. And uh, in the, at the very earliest period of this colonial history, they realized that if they wanted to expand their settlements in the New World, if they wanted to grow, they were going to have to fight the Native Americans for the land. And uh, so that the original story of America's formation is the story of an Indian war. And because the colonies uh, at this origin point were extraordinarily religious, most of them are Puritan, uh, either explicitly or uh, in, in their style of thinking, they think of this, uh, this social or political conquest of the wilderness in religious terms as a regeneration or rebirth of the English spirit uh, in the New World uh, as, a, as a kind of pathway to salvation. And the earliest stories uh, that they tell uh, are in the form of Indian captivity narratives in which a woman who symbolizes the colony is captured by Indians and spiritually tested by these devils, as they, they think of the Indians. Uh, and her rescue, her redemption, uh, is, a, is a rebirth uh, and a, a reconstruction of the personality uh, in American terms. And that, that's really what, that was the origin of that concept, that, the, uh, that what the colonist imagines his history is, is a story of a transformation, a regeneration, or a rebirth through the violent conquest of the wilderness of the new world. And, and one of the, I'm thinking a couple of things. One of them is, um, as I was originally reading your books and then, and then reading them again, I, I, I kept thinking about this line by Robert J. Lifton. Um, he wrote the Nazi doctors and, and many other books. And yes, one of the, one of the central things that I took away from, from a lot of his work is that before you can commit any atrocity, you have to convince yourself that what you are doing is not, in fact, an atrocity, but instead you are doing a good thing. 
So yes. the um, Nazis were not, in their own perspective, committing genocide, but they were purifying the Aryan nation or purifying the Aryan right. state. Right. And, now, yeah, in, in the in American terms, the 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 good deed that they're doing is rescuing their women and children from the menace of the Indian. And in doing that, they're also uh, defeating the primitive and advancing the civilized or the modern, as we would as we would call it. So, uh, and they definitely give it uh, at that very critical point of origin. It definitely has a Christian script to it, that it is the redemption of the soul. That by redeeming the captive from the Indians, you're redeeming a soul from the devil. So that there's a kind of spiritual uh, development. What happens as you go forward in time and you move away from that period of, of uh, almost uniform religious intensity, you get more secular versions of that same theme uh, in which uh, you're making civilization, uh, you're making the wilderness safe for democracy. You're making the wilderness safe for the new American democratic nation. As you move into the 19th century, uh, not only the American democratic nation, but for uh, economic progress of the most dramatic kind. Uh, first, agrarian development, the farms, but later technology, railroads, uh, gold mines, coal mines, oil wells, uh, the whole panoply of, of technology. And, um, and what this does is it writes uh, as a, uh, uh, this recurrence of the frontier theme all through American history. It, goes, it comes right down to the present. I mean, you look at Star Trek and what is space. Space is the final frontier. Um, uh, what you have is this theme in which the American becomes American, becomes a wonderful, democratic, progressive being by putting down nature, by, by, by conquering nature and putting down the savage. And there's a racial script there, clearly. Uh, the Indians are defined as an alien people, an alien race. And uh, throughout our history, we have found other races who stood in at different times for, uh, for Indians in this script of conquest and, uh, and progress. Uh, so you have Mexicans at one point during the expansion into the Southwest. You have uh, Filipinos and Asians uh, towards the end of the 19th century and so on. And, um, I mean, this, this may be too silly of a question, but so where, where does that racial component, what, where does that come from and go to? Well, it comes from, if, if you look at the history of American development, um, what you have is uh, the idea that the, the uh, and this again goes back to the fundamentals of, of American exceptionalism and, and the American myth, uh, in, the idea is that in the old world, in Europe, the only way for one group of people or class to make progress is to do it at the expense of another class. So for the English middle class to rise, it's got to overthrow the aristocracy or displace the aristocracy and oppress the working class. And the American idea is different. The, what the American dream or the American myth of progress says is that the American progresses not by exploiting his fellow American, but by exploiting nature, by discovering new lands, by discovering new natural resources, and later on by discovering new technologies and new, new processes. And what this story ignores is the fact that uh, in order to get the, the land that was the basis of agricultural progress, you had to displace the Indians. You also, uh, in, in half the country, uh, agricultural progress required uh, the enslavement, the importation and enslavement of Africans. So you have this, this story of progress in which, in fact, you are exploiting others, but you, dis but you justify that by saying, well, they're not, they don't belong to the same species that we do. Uh, they're not white, and uh, America is in its origins, uh, and thinks that the Americans think of themselves as primarily a white republic from which Indians and blacks can legitimately be excluded. And so it's legitimate to exploit blacks and Indians as if they were 
uh, part of nature, not part of humanity, as if they were like um, livestock or trees uh, or natural resources of any kind. And that's the that's the, that's the, the the core of the of, of the, that's why ra- ra- racial difference is so fundamental to American ideas of social difference. And and this all ties, of course, to um, to the exploitation of women as well, because I'm thinking about the sort of central central notion of patriarchy. It seems to me is and this is a central notion of all racism too, is finding some way to differentiate self from other and then using that differentiation as an excuse for the exploitation of the other. Yes. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, 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 the women are an important um, symbol in the development of this racial script, in, of this racial idea. Uh, that it's your assumption about non-white humans is that like women, they are there for the use of men. Uh, they are there to produce for men in, in certain ways. There are differences, however, um, in the way in which women function in this, this myth system and this, the, the ideology that's based on this mythological system. And that is that white women have an extraordinarily or symbolically privileged position. Uh, you justify the oppression of blacks, the enslavement of blacks, and, and later on the, the, um, the use of Jim Crow to keep blacks isolated within society, ostensibly to protect white women. Uh, you destroy the Native Americans, you destroy the Indians to protect white women from savage captivity and attack. So there is this, this peculiar duality in the way in which white women are treated within uh, within the system, and their, their symbolic importance work, works in both those ways. So one of the things that I I love about your work is that you is the way you really seamlessly weave popular culture and historical um, movements is the wrong word historical yes something um, mm-hmm. and so can you give some examples of what of the themes that you've been talking about? And it could be the the, the theme you just mentioned about women, or it could be the, the 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 land theft. It could be the exploitation of the the differentiation of of Africans or or Filipinos. And can you talk about? Can you give some examples from film or popular literature that? I mean, that's one of the things that just absolutely blew me away about your work is I'd be reading along about some historical, um, for lack of a better word, occurrences, and then you would throw in some just perfectly spot on examples from either popular literature or film that would show how mm-hmm. the popular literature or film was um, paving the way for the military exploitation. Well, uh, l- let me say, first of all, that the way in which you figure out or you establish that there is, in fact, a, a mythological pattern at work, is by looking at a whole range of cultural productions. One movie or one novel or one history or one speech can't create a, a national myth. It's a pattern that you have to, before you can say you've found it, you have to say, I see it in dozens of places all at, all at, uh, at the same time. So in a sense, the, 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 the interplay between studying the polit- political ideology, political speeches, and popular ideas uh, re- reflected in popular culture, that, that's how you figure out that what you've got is a myth. But to take an example, uh, fairly current stuff, um, think of the way in which in the, uh, in the years after Vietnam, uh, after Vietnam there was something called Vietnam Syndrome, uh, a, a deep reluctance of Americans uh, to imagine the country re-engaging in war in a serious way. Um, and uh, you, don't get war, you don't get a lot of war films made in this period. What you get is science fiction movies, um, movies like uh, the Star Trek series, in which a federation of like a platoon, like an ethnic platoon from a World War II movie, representing 
Earth people, but we all know that it's, it's like America's melting pot, against some enemy who is either super technological, like the Borg, or semi-savage, like the Klingons. Uh, and the Klingons, are, actors are often played by non-whites. Um, and uh, Gene Roddenberry actually said that he modeled the Klingons on a combination of uh, the Apaches, who are the great villains of Western movies, uh, and uh, sort of uh, Mongol uh, warlords. So there is in this, in this uh, movie, which is about the democracy called the Space Federation, a, a script in which us guys have to advance civilization against either super technological machines or against uh, or against uh, savages. And we're still out there on the frontier. A movie like Aliens, um, uh, you you can't you're not allowed to hate other human races. It's, it, we've now accepted that that's a bad thing. But in science fiction, your enemies are not human. They're bugs. They're insectoids. And so you can indulge in a fantasy of race war without actually having to pay, so to speak, the moral penalty of race war. And then if you compare a movie like Aliens with a movie like Black Hawk Down, in which you see that in, in Aliens, the insectoids come swarming through the channels of the space station to get the good guys. Uh, and the good guys are doing what? They're rescuing a little girl who's been, in a sense, a captive of the insectoids. So we're on a rescue mission, and the insects are crawling through the streets after us. In, in Black Hawk Down, what are we doing? We're there to rescue the Somalis. We get into a, a fight instead, and the black people come crawling through the streets, swarming through the streets to get us and kill us and massacre us. And if you follow those two films, you can actually see close visual parallels in the way in which the, the, the ultimate shootout and the ultimate explosion that settles everything is, uh, is set up. And, that's, and that, you know, if you take that scenario, rescuing the captive from the subhuman savages, you see the same script in Mary Rowlandson's captivity narrative from 1682, and you see that script in Fenimore Cooper's Last of the Mohicans in 1826. Uh, and you see that in uh, John Wayne and the Searchers in 1856. And you see it in Aliens in 1986. And you see it in uh, Black Hawk Down in 2002. And yeah, that's, that's all fabulous stuff and or horrific stuff, either however you want to look at it. And it, um, another element that I remember specifically from the movie Last of the Mohicans, um, the Daniel Day Lewis movie, was that, yes. Um, I, I've seen this elsewhere, but I specifically remember watching that film and noticing that when a white person would die, their fellows would grieve, but often yes. when one of the American Indians would die. Um, there was a, um, there, there would never be shown, or I don't recollect there being shown that their, that their fellows, that their loved ones. Yeah. Be. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it's particularly true in movies because movies are a visual medium, but, the, but the contrasts of race, uh, in the way in which the, in the manners, uh, or the, the, the ways in which, uh, the different races act and the way in which their emotional lives are treated. That's, it's, it, it's very much a part of the, the vocabulary of cinema. Uh, but, uh, in the United States, it goes back to this notion that the, that in American society, until, uh, uh, really until the 1960s, there was, a, there was a fundamental legal distinction in most of the country between white citizens and black citizens. Uh, and for most of the history before that, blacks did, not, blacks did not belong to the body politic. They were not persons, they were property. And, and that's, a, that's a kind of distinction that has sunk into our, our, the vocabulary of symbols, the language that is what I call our national mythology, and it's very, very difficult to uh, get beyond it. There's, there's ever since you 
you agreed to do the interview, there's been one thing I've been thinking, and I've, I've conducted a lot of interviews in my life, and also been interviewed a bunch of times in my life, and mm-hmm. and I've never actually done this in interviews before, but but I've been so I'm a little bit nervous to try it, but um, but I've been thinking this ever since you said yes, so I'm I'm going to try it, and I hope it works out. Which okay. is, uh, um, I don't know if this happens to you, but when I when I read a book, and then the book when I read a book, and then it's ten years later. Oftentimes there is one one message that comes through, and there's one thing I remember. It's like somebody says, "So what was Gunfighter Nation about?" You know, I don't right. I don't give them 800 pages worth. I usually give them two sentences worth. And right. it's the same with my own books, of course. And something that I've never done on air before, but I want to try is I want to tell you what like is the one sentence synopsis that I got, and then you can you can tell me okay. whether that was secondary, tertiary, whatever. All right, go ahead. That okay. The when somebody says, "So what was this? What was Gunfighter Nation about?" One of the things I say is that one of the images I took from the whole trilogy was that part of the central stories that we see again and again. And this is a, this was life changing for me. This is one of the reasons that I say that I love your book so much is that um, one of the central stories of this culture is that we always want to fight fair. But the other side fights dirty. So just yes. this once, just this one time only, we got to fight dirty because they're so bad. Yes. Right. And so was that was that primary, secondary, tertiary? When you were writing it, you know, where did that fall in the sort of hierarchy of how important your ideas were in the book? I think that's one of the. I think that's one of the the uh, one of the primary themes. Uh, not the only one, but I think it is one of the primary themes. Um, it, it's uh, and again, it goes back to uh, to how the myth works. The myth works by creating a, a hero who has to have a, a kind of plausible personality and emotional life. And the heroes in, in Amer- uh, 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 of this this frontier myth are guys who stand on the border between two orders, between savagery, let's call it, and civilization, between Indians and whites. And the, the reason that they're the hero is that they can, they, they, I call it the white man who knows Indians. He can beat the Indians because he knows how they work. He knows how to think like them. And he knows how to think like them because he's attracted to them. He's drawn to uh, what in Star Wars is called the dark side of the force. Um, and so, yes, so that the central story always involves the hero going to the dark side, uh, the hero fighting like an Indian, uh, the hero borrowing some technique from the enemy that he has to use in order to defeat the enemy. And in so doing, he, he compromises himself. Uh, he's not, um, it's not a, a, it's not a sort of a, he's not like Superman uh, who never compromises himself. Uh, he's, uh, he's a human being who, who uh, and a tragic figure in many ways, who does compromise himself in order to save the world for the rest of us. Um, and yeah, so he learns to he learns to fight dirty, and you can see this again if you want to take it up to the, the present. One of the um, one of the more modern and more interesting versions of this story is what I call the platoon movie, and this really dates from the Second World War, and it takes all of these elements of the frontier story that I've been talking about that the American defines himself in combat against the savage enemy from whom he's, for whom he's trying to save civilization. It dates from the Second World War, and the difference in the platoon movie is that instead of a, a, a white man or a group of white men, the ethnic platoon is ethnically and even racially mixed, representing America as a multi-ethnic, multi-racial society for the first time in American history, and that really starts in 1943. Now, how does this multi-racial platoon work? How does this, this new model, American nation, come together? They come together in the face of an enemy who is more alien than any of the constituent elements of the platoon, the Japanese or the Nazis in World War II. The Japanese and the Nazis fight dirty. In order to beat them, that is to say they fight in a way which is cruel and unscrupulous. Let's, let's put it that way. In order to beat them, we have to, we have to fight that way. We even have to learn to hate the way they hate us. And so uh, the paradox of this new version of the multiracial America is that 
the, the, the fire that melts the constituents of the melting pot, it's hatred of an external, uh, hatred of an external enemy and learning to fight dirty like that enemy. And uh, the, of course, the, 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 if, you, if you play this out politically, it's a, it can be a justification for, uh, for, for uh, doing immoral things in the name of the natural, national interest. The enemy tortures, so we have to torture. Uh, the enemy uh, does covert operations to uh, destroy us. We have to do covert operations to destroy them. And one of the things that I remember reading, I don't remember which book it was, but I remember reading a book by Norman Solomon. He does a lot of media, accuracy media stuff. And mm -hmm. um, this was, I remember reading about 1990 or so, about the time that Manuel Noriega went from being a favorite to a, to a unfavorite of the United States. Mm -hmm. And I happened to read a section where they talked about how if someone, if a dictator is liked by the United States, he's called the president. And if he's not liked by the United States, he's called the strong man. And then that right. afternoon, I, I was teaching Eastern Washington University at the time. And that afternoon, I was driving home from work, listening to NPR, and they started talking about Manuel Noriega, the Panamanian strong man. And right. I had just read it that day. And so it affected me so strongly, I had to pull over to the side of the road and just think for a minute. Like, and, and I keep coming back to, you know, how what your books have done for me in part because it was one of those things where I never, you know, that, that image that I said of what we want to fight fair, but we have to fight dirty because of, of them. That was one of those things that right. I hadn't made that connection, but then I read your books and I saw it everywhere. It's like, it's the dirty Harry movies. It's yes. United States. And another thing about this, it's really crucial. I think is always the implication that we're, we, the, the good people are only going to, to do this terrible thing, fight in a cruel and unscrupulous way, just this once. And so we can convince ourselves that even though the United States torture, used torture rampantly in the invasion of the Philippines, that we can still convince ourselves that enhanced interrogation techniques are a brand new thing. And right. it's just this once. And that's, that's part of it too. And I even see that in personal relationships, like abusive relationships, where the abuser is convinced that, you know, just this once we have to have this abusive incident because. Right. And it, so it just, it just, the power of that image of the one time because of you, just, it, it strikes me as really ubiquitous within, no, it's not ubiquitous, it's too strong, but it strikes me as something mm -hmm. that can be seen in movie after, it, we can be seen, you know, almost everywhere we look. Yes, uh, I think that though that the that the 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 the, the pretense of the story uh, and the way that the story is being told is that this extraordinary let's call it an extraordinary act of violence. Okay. This extraordinary act of violence only has to be done once because it's a special occasion. We wouldn't do it if it weren't an extraordinary occasion. But once you take that um, that story and you put it out as story. Then it is, it's more than just an incident. Then it's a model for imagining ways to deal with similar problems. One of the things about myth is it's not simply a, uh, a story about the past. It's a story that's meant to be used. It's meant to be it's meant to, the, 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 hero, the hero stories from the past are supposed to provide us with models for how we deal with a, a crisis in the present. So, for example, um, you have the just to take two, two sort of recent incidents. You have Richard Nixon prepping himself for, for the confrontations of Watergate by watching Patton over and over again, seeing how a strong uh, the story of a strong man can provide him with a model for how to de how to behave in a crisis. Or George Bush, before George W. Bush, I should say, uh, before invading Iraq, watches uh, Black Hawk Down over and over. To get uh, because to him there's a there's a message in there for what uh, for, for for how to handle a crisis rightly and how to handle in his, his case he saw the movie as a mistake we withdrew from Somalia and that showed us we were weak and that was the lesson he took from that movie so uh, so once you put the story out there even though it's the story of an extraordinary crisis it's out there and it serves as a model. Uh, one of the things I argue, I've written a lot about uh, lynching 
in uh, particularly in the period between the Civil War and uh, 19, uh, 1925 in the United States. And there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of fiction uh, about lynching. Uh, the most notable would be uh, Thomas Dixon's novel The Klansman, that was the basis of the movie uh, Birth of a Nation. But there's a lot of such stories and novels about lynching. And every one of these stories represents the lynching as something extraordinary, in response to an extraordinary crisis. And yet the net effect is to say um, th that, that the way we responded to this extraordinary crisis is a lesson to us about how we must meet similar crises in the future. And it's also a lesson to the groups against whom the, the story is directed what they can expect from us if they get out of line. So, it's, so even though it's the story of something exceptional, once it becomes a story, it's not an exception, it's an example which can be used in a, and it's meant to be an example that can be cited in a variety of circumstances. So let's go back to um, sort of the definition of mythology, the, the, the right, definition right. for this conversation of mythology and right. how you were saying that, um, you know, you can have one story that goes in an entirely different direction, um, but that doesn't make the mythology. The, the, the mythology comes from the sort of um, looking at the looking at the whole of the, the, the sort of general movement. It's like in a river. You can have eddies that go another direction, but generally the current yes. is one direction. And right. one of the ways I think about that also is that not mm -hmm. only do these stories, as you just said, create the model, but in addition, the culture, only, only the stories that fit within the cultural model will generally um, gain huge acceptance. And one of the ways I think about this is that the music of Jimi Hendrix would probably not have worked in the 1920s because the right. culture wasn't ready for it. And right. so having to do with this, how do we, if we recognize that we, that, that this model, I mean, I perceive the model you're describing as incredibly destructive. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the mythology as destructive. Yes. And, and so how, how do we, I don't know. The thing I'm thinking is that so many indigenous people have said to me is the first and most important thing that we have to do is to decolonize our hearts and minds. And yes. what I'm trying to get at here is so it seems to me that the, that you have provided a really important first step toward demythologizing this mythology by naming it. Yes. And, and now what, what do we do on, on a large scale? I'll ask personally in a second. On a large scale, what do we do now that we recognize this mythology? How do we how do we change it? Well, how, how, what 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 do we do? Well, uh, that's a huge question. Um, I think there are there are, there are there are a few things that one has to do. One of them is, as you said, to name it, to analyze it, to expose it as what it is. I mean, one of the reasons why mythology works the way it does is that it's accepted as normative it's, it's accepted as a given it's not simply it's not a it's not a racist story it's simply a story of the way things were and had to be <coughs> excuse me um, oh, second. so so one so one thing is, okay. is to call it out as as what it is that it's an artificial construct of a historical uh, a histor series of historical events which could be interpreted in a different way if seen from a different point of view um, that's one way to handle it. Uh, another way which artists have found to handle it is to work through the language to undo the language. Um, a good example of that is a book like Huckleberry Finn, where <coughs> we have Huck, uh, Huck Finn. It, it hinges, it, it's a book that hinges on the N-word. And um, uh, Huck is someone for whom that word defines black people. And yet, though he continues to use that word and to think in those terms, his experiences with Jim going down the river and with slavery going down the river discredit the original meanings that he attaches to that word. It undoes it. And it puts him in a place where uh, he can't, at the end of the book, he, he, he can't entirely uh, 
give up that way of thinking. He was still raised in that culture. But the reader who has followed him through says, oh, God, Huck, why can't you make the final? You've made every step but the last one. Why can't you make the last one? And by saying that to Huck in imagination, you're in a sense saying, I've made the last step. Uh, a similar case would be, uh, although I think some people disagree with this, uh, John Ford's uh, The Searchers, in which starts out with a racist as the hero, John Wayne's character of uh, Ethan Edwards, and it undoes him, and it undoes his values uh, through the course of the film. Uh, it goes from, uh, uh, from Indian hating to something very different from that. Uh, and that's, a, that's another way to do it. The problem with both of those two things, which I just said, is that the power of the myth is such that every retelling, in some ways, reinforces it. Um, uh, criticism can do something to, to unmask it, but, uh, but it, it also points to the attractiveness of the story. And, of course, the art, the art, artful treatment, reiterates the... The, the terms of the story. So um, the third thing, uh, which uh, of which we uh, where we have less control, is that societies do change, and when they change, either the mythology and the ideology that governs the society adapts to the new circumstances, or the society explodes. Uh, and what's happened in the United States and what happened in the 20th century is that a mythology which represented the United States as a white man's republic was seriously modified, uh, coming really out of the Second World War. To rep and it wasn't simply a white man's republic. It was a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant man's republic to make it now a nation of immigrants. Uh, a nation of, of ethnics, of hyphenated Americans, uh, and a nation in which non-whites of a huge variety are now uh, much, more, uh, much more centrally included in our understanding of what it means to be an American. Now, I don't want to sound like Pollyanna here because it's perfectly clear from the rhetoric of the, the two Obama campaigns that for a lot of white America, non-white Americans are not real Americans and ethnic Americans are not real Americans. So there is still that strain in our society. But the change from when I was growing up is phenomenal. I, I was born in 1942, really came to consciousness in the late 40s uh, and the 1950s, and, and white supremacy, the language of white supremacy was the language. It wasn't, it, it wasn't marginalized, it was mainstream. Uh, you had either nice white supremacy or not so nice white supremacy, tolerant white supremacy or intolerant white supremacy. And now white supremacy has to apologize for itself in this country. To me, that, to me that's huge. And it's made a difference in the stories that we tell. The difference is that characters who used to be excluded from the story or marginalized within the story are now brought into the center of the story. And I'll give you, to give you the sense of what the, the strength of that and the, and the, the limits of that, uh, take the role of women. Uh, in, in the national myth, the warrior is the key figure. The Indian fighter, the hunter, is the key figure, and the key figure is always male. If you look at recent cinema, recent science fiction starting in the 80s, you get a film like Aliens, where Ripley, the woman, is the white man who knows Indians. She is the, 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 uh, the, the Hawkeye type hero. It's now possible for, for women to have that role and for non-whites to have that role. So there's that change, that, that inclusion is now there. But, but the story structure in which the new people are acting isn't different enough from the old story. It's still the story of this kind of race war on the border. Years and years ago, probably 13, 14, oh my gosh, maybe 15, 16, 17 years ago now, I interviewed George Gerbner. Do you know his work? I think so, yeah. Yeah, he was the TV violence guy. But oh, yes, okay, yes. Yeah. Yes. And 
when I, I loved interviewing. He was great. And one of the things he said is that everybody misinterprets his work, that his big deal wasn't how much violence there is on TV, um, although he did have something to say about that. But the bigger deal, he thought, is the question, and I'm just saying this to validate what you just said, his question is always who does what to whom, that violence is a social right. relationship. And so what right. he's really interested in, which not many people wanted to talk about, he said, is the percentage of violence that's done by white males. He said, this is how you, quote, create minorities. This is how you create yes. subservience, is by showing in the media all the time that white males win every conflict. Um, right. And they do so, to use your word, using the gun. Right. Um, Go ahead. So, so if you so if you change that story, if you take that same script, and you put a black man in the in the lead role, which has been done, or an Asian man in that role, which has been done, or a woman in that role, which has been done, you do change the the uh, the mythology of power. You say, yes, these peoples who once are considered marginal or subordinate now can act as the center, the representatives of the center, the representatives of, of the state. But the action that they engage in still follows the same pattern. And we recognize that they're heroes because they have the same kinds of enemies that the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant male frontiersmen had. Well, and this leads to a problem too, and I, we've only got a few minutes left, so this is a huge topic, yeah. but this leads to a problem too that you you talked about in Gunfighter Nation with um, uh, the Wild Bunch, where yes. they um, where they choose. I, I don't remember your exact language, but basically you say that they choose the gun over dem over democracy. Right. And right. That leads to, and you you correlate that, which is once again one of the things I love about the book. You correlate that to um, U.S. foreign policy in Vietnam. And yes. Uh, instead of me just sort of hemming and hawing about that, maybe you can talk about that also changing the story. And I don't mean to be Pollyannish. I'm certainly not Pollyannish about about yeah. democracy or nonviolence working in every circumstance. But can you talk about changing that sto the larger story too? Well, yeah. I mean, that would be an example. I, I parallel with what I said about Huckleberry Finn earlier. That that in Wild Bunch, you have the your, the, the movie plays with these notions of what is it that justifies violence. Uh, violence in the name of a democratic revolution is uh, uh, superior to violence in the name of repressing that democratic revolution. And then the question is, where do the Ameri and this is all taking place in Mexico, the question is, where do the Americans fit in and how do they, how do they act? And the, the irony at, at the heart of the film is that the Americans end up, after playing both sides, they end up fighting for the democratic revolution of the, the, the Mexican uh, peasantry for all the wrong reasons, uh, not because they're Democrats, but because they're proud gunfighters and they've been humiliated by the uh, Mexican warlord and because they're loyal gang members, they have loyalty to each other, and one of their, one of their own has been uh, tortured by the, uh, the Mexican warlord. Um, and... Uh, when you when you tell the story in that way, you expose the um, the, the fact that the, that that in the American story that violence has its own is, is almost its own justification. It's almost a good in itself. Violence is what makes the hero, and it makes him a hero no matter what cause he's fighting for, or no matter what reasons he has for uh, for fighting. Uh, and that shows the irrationality uh, of the story. Shows it in, in, in the in the classic Greek manner by, uh, by in a sense, by by playing out a tragedy. Um, so basically, we've got like a minute left. So okay. I know that we've we've. I mean, this has been, I think, a really intense. This will be a really intense experience for a lot of, of readers. And I'm sorry to even ask this, but so, you know, if you could. What would you want readers to take, listeners to this, to take away? You know, it's like, wow, I heard this great interview today, and um, what was it about? You know, what 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 would be the take-home point that you want for people to really to really grasp? I guess it's the uh, they, they that they should get the sense that the this story of American exceptionalism that we're so proud of depends on a set of of illusions and and a cruel illusion 
the illusion that you can uh, you can gain make make e- economic progress simply by exploiting nature without cost to your fellow human beings, and that that's what we do. That's how Americans make progress. When in fact we exploit labor uh, all the time. And the second thing is that uh, American history uh, is the story of uh, uh, is is a violent story in which, in the name of various kinds of ideals, we have uh, killed, dispossessed, and oppressed Native Americans, blacks, and and others uh, who got in the way of this drive for uh, for wealth and progress. Well, thank you so much for your work, and thank you for being on the program. And thank you for I, asking me. Oh, gosh, thank you. And I would like to thank people for listening. Uh, my guest today has been Richard Slotkin. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.